Hello everyone and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. With me as always is my loyal co-host Michael Walker. How you doing, Walker? Always good, Mark. How are you today? I'm holding it together, Walker. Good stuff. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and I would just like to start off by apologizing, issuing a semi-retraction. I had some heated words last week about people who are not medical doctors using the term doctor, and I said that Steve Finn of Dr. Finn Games, I hope that the doctor was kind of a joke. He very graciously reached out on Twitter and said, yeah, actually, it did start out as a joke. But then I realized that I am, of course, a raving hypocrite, because very often when people call themselves doctor, it's cheeky. Like, for example, Reiner Knizia. I mean, I don't know in what way he refers to himself as doctor. He sometimes does. So I'm, if I'm willing to give a pass to Reiner Knizia, I should be willing to give a pass to philosophers as well. So look, if you're a philosopher and you want to call yourself doctor, fill your boots. It was all meant lightly anyway. It was all meant lightly. And look, of course, I have the utmost respect for people who engage in post-secondary education. And if Walker could read, I'm sure he would feel the same way. It's true. With that in mind, we are going to talk about board games this week. We're going to talk about our Aurus, the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, the game we reviewed last year. Then we're going to talk about the games we played last week, the news and why it doesn't matter, and then our topic. And our topic this week is the agony and the ecstasy of combos. Walker, what did we review last year? Exactly one year ago, we reviewed a game called Cloudspire by Chip Theory Games. We did indeed. And since then, they've come out with a second Kickstarter to uh, provide games to people who haven't had it and to tack on some uh, expansions as per the Kickstarter rules. But you can't just do a second Kickstarter. So It's the iron law, yeah. So there is an... Uh, two expansions. They were called the Uprising Faction and Horizon's Wrath Faction. Now, to be fair, when we reviewed the game, we didn't even play with the first expansion faction, the Greege, and we didn't have the ads, on, the add-ons, the bells and whistles. Also, it's the case. I was informed by this by a listener that they have a sort of a, a 2.0 upgrade with a new rulebook, a new rulebook format. They've upgraded some of the iconography. They've replaced a whole lot of the chips, and uh, I don't care. It was just not a game for us, that's for sure. There's a puzzly yeah. bit, there's a huge setup, there's a and, and ridiculous game length. There is it is a great if you play games with the same person and you and and you sit on a game for a while and and search for all of its ins and outs, then this is definitely something that you might want to look into. It's very tactful, it's very in depth, it's very long. It's very puzzly. <laughs> I, d- I wouldn't even know that the length was a problem in and of itself, because there are lots of two-player games that I like that are two hours or even a little bit more. For me, it was the experience I had playing Cloudspire was very much the experience that I hear other people have about playing Rum and Bones. You know, they talk about how tedious it is to manage all the mobs in Rum and Bones, whereas, to my mind, it's very simple. You pick up a cluster of plastic pirates, you shove them over one space, and you're done. Whereas in Cloudspire, the, the, the salient thing that I remember from Cloudspire is the endless move a couple spaces, do a damage, move a couple spaces. Okay, well, where's the pathing going for this minion? Because the minions, you don't have any control over them, and they just follow their own little AI. And I found that a little bit obnoxious. And for what it's worth as a capper... Cloudspire was, I think, one of the best indications for me that Chip Theory Games is married to a certain component set regardless of functionality because it is not possible to shuffle neoprene mats. They should have been tiles. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my position. It's That's my hot take. If, you, if it needs to be shuffled, don't make it neoprene. That is my controversial stance on the production values of Chip Theory Games. And it's coming out. What was their newest game that's coming out? Burn Cycle. Burn Cycle should be out this year? Uh, well, sometimes after Chinese New Year. Yes. That's the release date of all Kickstarters sometime after Chinese New Year. Assuming, of course, that you can find a shipping container for it. This is all true. And that is the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. Now, on to the games we played this last week. I always say this week. You always say last week. It's a great controversy, and someday I'm sure it will be our Yoko Ono. I, I'm sure it will matter. We both got to play a game called Merchant's Cove. This is designed by Johnny Pack, Carl Von Ostrin, and Drake Villarreal. Published by Final Frontier Games. Now this is, I guess, could you say that this is a coin, like a coin type game? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Not really. I don't know. I, I've never played a coin game, so I don't know. But anyway. Yes, you have. Ev- you played a distant plane. Okay, distant plane. Anyway, in uh, Merchant's Cove, everyone has their own sort of play area. They're all playing their sort of own type of character, their own type of game, but it's all leading towards the same thing. We're trying to produce these goods. 
for these adventurers that are coming back from their quest. And now we have to resupply them and we have to sort of look out into the distance and see which adventures are either a coming to our cove or B, which ones survived the adventure. I don't know how exactly you want to word it, but we sort of get a glimpse of, of who's coming and then the boats slowly fill up and we got to make goods to provide these adventurers and, and sell them at a good price. And I, I didn't mind it terribly. <laughs> what did you think, Mark? So the, the aspect that I think makes you analogize it to coin games is that there's a fundamental structure of the game that everyone shares. And the big difference is how the different players produce goods. You know, they all sell them the same way. They all value them the same way. But producing them is entirely different. And they have their own sets of components to do this and their own sub-mechanisms and so forth. All, all, I'm, all I was thinking is about people often have said Roots is a coin type game. And right. I thought this was like a, a Root type game where everyone sort of had their completely own play style, but it all, you know, funneled into the same main board type thing. Uh, true. In that sense, they're similar, but coin means counterinsurgency. Gotcha. And the dynamic that, that the Root games are pointing to is that you do have this sense of a vaguely evocative counterinsurgency in that some factions engage in conventional warfare and others don't. But ah. anyway, setting all that aside, I, I, I felt that. Unlike Root in Merchant's Cove, the asymmetry didn't add to the experience because in my particular case, I can't comment on how anyone else was producing goods because quite frankly, I, I never internalized how they produce goods. And to a certain extent, that's okay because I didn't really need to know how someone would produce a good of a certain color. I mostly needed to know what they had for sale. And that was easy. You just look over and say, oh, this person's selling yellow. Well, then I guess I can't make the market too good for yellow. My principal objection to Merchant's Cove was how the market worked. Because you said that the boats slowly fill up, and it's it's the boats bringing in adventurers, and that determines how and what you can sell, where, when, and, and how much it's going to give you. It doesn't fill up slowly. They can fill up real fast. You can take a single one-turn action, because there are one-turn actions and two-turn actions and possibly in some of the other factions, three-turn actions, and you take your little one-turn action and then suddenly one of the boats is home. And the fact that it came home in a certain way means that the good that you produce cannot be sold at all because there's limited spots on the queue and you can only sell certain types of goods at certain places. And I respect what they were trying to do. They were trying to have a new kind of risky slash a little bit of push your luck supply and demand element. But honestly, I felt that the control of the market was way too little of, for any, any given player. And when you couple that with, and I'm going to speculate on the way you produce goods, and I, I, I'd appreciate your comment on this. The way I produced goods was more or less random. I was the quote unquote captain and I dug for treasure. Well, if the market really was rewarding red goods, as happened in two of the three rounds in Merchant's Cove, we were awash in red demand. And I was entirely subject to random draws as to whether or not I would be getting any of the big red goods. And you were playing a dice game. Correct. And I guess I, I, you could say, almost say that I was subject to, I'd, I'd roll the dice at the beginning of the round, and then I'd slot those dice in. High dice produced big goods, low dice produced little goods. And I guess I might have been locked in, but there was some actions I could take that would, you know, manipulate the dice. Oh, okay. And every forge had like a coal die that was set at the beginning of the game, one through one through four. And I could turn those throughout the game as well to sort of like constantly set, you know, a little bit higher or a little bit lower. So... That, that was the blacksmith, so he was interesting. Like you said, you played the captain. Huey played the alchemist, who had this interesting, like, marble game. They'd, like, they would drop down, and he would make potions and stuff. And then there is also the time traveler, who has an assistant, and they go around this track, and you sort of have to follow the rules of how they move. And there's some interesting expansions, like the dragon tamer and the hag and innkeeper. So all sorts of different ways you could play. I'm interested to try it again. I, I, when I read the rules, I felt as though the way it played as well, that, that it was fundamentally the same. I like the one mechanism where you were, uh, hiring a bunch of the locals and you had this whole strip of sort of medium actions that were semi, would have got s pretty useful, right? So you would take an action and the whole strip would activate as long as you had the locals working those slots. And if yeah, there was, a, there was a touch of tableau builder run up to it. And one of the actions was run your tableau. Yeah. So if you got it filled up quickly, that action probably would have, you know, helped us out more, I think. Yeah, that part was cute. I started doing that in the second and third rounds. Initially, when you explained it, I didn't think it was going to be very consequential. But around the end of round one, I looked down and said, oh, this this would actually work out pretty neatly. That part was okay. As I say, my, my principal problem was just how the supply and demand element worked. 
it if the boats were bigger, if the distribution of adventurers were different, if you could manipulate the distribution of adventurers, there's a variant in the base game where there's a queue of adventurers, so you can add a penalty. Rather than drawing blindly from a bag to add to the supply, you can choose from a queue, and so you might have some idea of what's coming up next. I'd probably prefer that. But honestly, even then, I, I don't feel that the asymmetry in terms of, terms of producing goods was anything more than a gimmick. Because at the end of the day, the overwhelming preponderance of the consequential actions in the game are going to be ultimately decided by where you can sell and how. And that just felt incredibly arbitrary to me. And the fact that it was the only player interaction, it sort of doubled down on the, you know what I mean? It was, yes. you could not control that. And the fact that it was the only source of how we interacted with each other sort of, you know, really brought that whole, that whole part of the game into full painfulness. Yes. And that was Merchant's Cove published by Final Frontier Games. I had a good week for solo tabletop miniatures games. I got together with the Hondrucker, and we got to finish off our campaign of Rangers of Shadowdeep. The base book contains a series of introductory missions, and then an initial campaign called Burning Light. And we decided prior to my departure for the West Coast that we were going to burn through this, no pun intended, and play the last two scenarios. And it was very, very nice to return to Rangers of Shadowdeep. I have a fair amount, as I've commented before, of headcanon attached to the characters involved. There's character progression, there's a sort of pseudo-RPG system, you know, imagine kind of a 5th ed D&D super, 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 super light. Solo and co-op compatible, very simple monster AI. You run through scenarios and there's a, there's a certain amount of paragraph system going on. The level of narrative is just enough to keep my interest, especially in the face of the fact that, and this is a, an ongoing frustration for me, I've kind of been ruined for tabletop miniatures games unless they have an interesting resolution mechanism. Joseph McCulloch, the author of Rangers of Shadowdeep, who is also the author of Frostgrave, a very, very successful game line, now it's in, in its second edition with Osprey, is attached to a dueling D20 re combat resolution system. You can do interesting things with D20s. Infinity does that, and I love Infinity's resolution system. But let me just put it this way. When you're fighting a rat with a combat value of plus zero, and your highly trained ranger, who has already been buffed by several magical items, has a combat value of six, well... The 30% spread isn't necessarily going to guarantee anything in particular happening. This is not a complaint about difficulty. This is just a complaint about flukiness. Then when you consider the fact that the final boss of Burning Light, no spoilers, had a combat modifier of plus five, you start to see the narrow horizons of what's going on here. So the varying results don't come in from a variety of tactics or a variety of decisions or a variety of skills. They come in from a variety of dice rolls, which is not ideal. But a good time was had by all. It was nice to return to something that, for me, was a primarily social experience with the Hanverker. The Hanverker gifted me with an absurdly beautiful set of painted miniatures with a ridiculously attractive carrying case that he functioned for himself. Honestly, if I had any capability of photography, I would definitely take some pictures and post them. I'm going to try, but the problem is every time I've tried, I've had the thought. It's like, ooh, people should see how good the Hanverker is and see, see what he's done. But I try taking the pictures. They just come out like mud because I don't know how to do those things anyway. So I was glad to return to Rangers of Shadowdeep. I don't know if I want to go back. I think I might be done with Rangers. And honestly, I might be done with the designs of Joseph McCulloch. Because as I say, interesting narrative. I enjoy that aspect. He can certainly build worlds. His world building is also very compelling. But the stumbling block is to me the resolution mechanism. And it, when it's just a, a series of close to combat, roll to kill, close to combat, roll to kill, close to combat. That's not quite enough for me anymore, especially when it comes to solo designs, when there are alternatives available. So that was my experience with Rangers of Shadowdeep. So I played a bunch of stuff on Twitch. I unboxed Dice Miner, and I played a solo game. So Dice Miner was a Kickstarter, and it's a sort of a dice drafting game. You fill up this interesting, like, sort of mountain, and you start drafting dice off the top. And the solo game is completely different than the actual multiplayer game. And in, in some cases, I feel it's almost more compelling, but I, I do like the sort of interaction. Mark and I also played a, a two-player game, and we I think we both felt it would it would benefit from more players just because the sure number of dice, because it doesn't modify the game whatsoever due to players. So in a multiplayer game, you have this plethora of characters you can choose from, and uh, it's a nice quick system. You, you know, draft the dice, your reroll mechanism, score, and you're on to the next round, of which there are only three. So what did you think of the, the multiplayer part of the Dice Miner? 
I liked the first round more than later rounds. It was, in fact, the opposite of Merchant's Cove because when we both had a small number of dice available, and this is why we speculated that more players might be nice, it was much easier to see what other people needed and work around that. But later on, as we got to further rounds, we had these massive dice pools, and it got to the point where maybe you could identify a choke point or two about something they need, but quite frankly, when you're in round two or three and you've got huge festivals of dice and you know that they're going to get tons and tons of rerolls by the end of the round... And at that point, you just say, and honestly, it kind of blunts the impact of you drafting anything in particular either, because you know you're going to get a whole bunch of rerolls at the end of the round. I desperately needed twos and threes the entire game, and I only felt that in the first round. By the second and third rounds, I had so many rerolls, I didn't care. I knew I was going to get there sooner or later. And I was intrigued by your des- description of the solo system. Yeah, so in the solo system, it's sort of almost exactly like solitaire. I don't know, it gave me the feeling of solitaire where you're trying to work down a pyramid system. You can only take, in the game, there's runs, and you can only take runs and form them immediately, so you have to get a one first. And in the multiplayer game, there's a, like a beer result. On one of the, on all the dice faces, there's a beer result, and you use that to give it to other players and lets you choose more dice. But in the solo game, it lets you turn it to any face, so they're much more powerful. And... You know, the whole mechanism works differently, and you get two chances to completely refill the the tower, and you use the magic dice to burn, like, so when you're totally stuck and you can't actually draft any dice because, you know, the runs are blocking it, or there's hazard dice there that you can't take, then, you know, you burn your magic dice to burn some dice off the top, and it, it worked very interesting. I, I, I think I'm going to play it quite often. It's, it's, it works very quickly. The, the game came with a nice little dry erase, you know, boards, even for the multiplayer, all in all, it's a very interesting production, and I definitely, you know, if it's something that sounds, you know, interesting, give it a try. It sounded like it had the same kind of appeal as those various Mahjong solitaire games, which can be quite enjoyable in their own way. You know, like, I, I need this particular thing, but it's being covered by something else. I need to draft a die so that I can uncover that die, which will then get me the thing that I need. Is, is that at all evocative? Exactly, no, exactly yeah. how it goes. Also, the video's up, so if, you, if it even sounds remotely interesting, check out on... Board Game Geek, I posted up the solo, the unboxing and the solo play. This is designed by Joshua Du Bois and Nikolai Verteski and published by Atlas Games. The other time I went on, I unboxed Vienna Connection and I played Railroad Inc. Challenge. This is a new app that's just came out and it's uh, based off of the most recent Kickstarter for Railroad Inc. where they sort of change up the map. Now there's like houses and factories and, and other locations that when you build on, you get you know extra stuff. Like the factory will let you use one of the, the dice that you rolled that turn. The houses will give you more points. The other spaces you get, there's like, you know, I don't know if you've ever played it, but there's like these really funky four connection special tiles that you get throughout the game okay and you'll get to play an additional one if you cover up three of these other areas and so what it does it gives you three challenges that start off at round three so three four and five you have to execute these special or have those challenges done by that time and then you try to get the highest score execution and train it's starting to sound violent i know i know all in all i think it's very interesting i'm i'm actually you know enjoying playing it it's one of those things where you know you have some free time you know you can knock a game off fairly quickly and you, you sound much more bullish about this one than the previous attempts at Railroad Inc. It's true. Uh, well, because the other ones were on Board Game Arena and it's sort of you know when you're doing one turn at a time these ones you can oh, get through Oh, I and, see you were doing it asynchronously. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is just a 5 minute, you know, go through try to get your highest score, try to beat your last score. Does it have little choo-choo noises? It's really well done. <laughs> Not only are there little choo-choo noises, but after... Mark, I see you making a stupid joke, but allow me to assure you. Let me assure you, <laughs> there are trains everywhere. And after you've, like, uh, uh, set all your dice out and click confirm, and then it converts it all to, like, sort of hand-drawn... Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's really well that done. That sounds great. So if it looks like something you're interested in, this is designed by Mar Huck and Lorenzo Silva, and this is published by Horrible Guild. And uh, they'll soon have, this is just, it's based off of the original Railroad Inc. But, uh, you know, of course, in the little sidebar, coming soon will be the ones that introduced the Railroad Inc. challenge, which is the yellow and the green. So they'll have that stuff soon enough. On the topic of streaming, we streamed the quest for El Dorado, the Golden Temples, for Parasocial Saturdays. Uh, just a programming note, due to the ongoing disintegration of my mental state, life, and livelihood, we will not be doing Parasocial Saturdays for the remainder of June. 
And while I'm on the road, Walker may or may not decide to have Parasocial Saturdays without me. We got to play The Quest for El Dorado, a Reiner Knizia game on Twitch. And it is also up on Board Game Geek, if you wish to watch that video. And it is a game where it is very interesting sort of map presence where you're trying to figure it away across this map. And we played with the Golden... The Golden Temples. Golden Temples. Which is an expand alone version. So the original game is sort of like a, a, a start at the start, finish at the finish. Now with the Golden Temples, you're hitting all the different checkpoints and getting the gems. So this led to uh, Huey and Mark going off in one direction, and I went off in the other. And I think due to their, you know, bumping into each other a little, gave me that one extra turn that I needed to come in. Well, in point of fact, you won by two turns, because you would have won the tiebreaker in either case. But I really prefer the Golden Temples, both because it opens up the map and because it's a little bit more balanced. There's this tradition of otherwise expert game designers saying, oh, deck building, I can do that. And I don't want to criticize the base version of the Quest for El Dorado. It's a great game. But it suffered from what I will call a few acres of snowitis, which Martin Wallace, he's like, oh, deck building, I can do that. And he released a few acres of snow. And novice deck building designs tend to fall victim to... The, over, the predominant strategy being aggressive deck pruning. And that was the case in the Quest for El Dorado. They, fi- they fixed that to a certain extent in Golden Temples with a number of clever moves. And the map is more open and I find the card set a little bit more interesting. And so I prefer the Golden Temples, but no shade on the original. I really enjoy it. I think it's a, a great light deck builder. It's one of my favorite ways to introduce an almost pure deck builder, but with some map presence. Yeah, it gives you that same feel. Like in in traditional deck builders, you're building your engine and you're figuring out when is at that point that you're going to transition your deck from buying more cards to buying victory points. So in Quest for El Dorado, maybe this is only my experience, but in my experience, it was creating my deck until I think I had enough movement and then stop buying cards and pour all my cards into movement. And and it seemed to work. I know. Do you just get that feeling as well? I don't know. I, I don't really conceive of it in those terms because you're not really buying victory points. And as such, I, I don't ever really. No, but I mean, there's a point where you stop just buying cards, you know, to improve your deck and you, and you, and you, well, and you decide that your deck is done. You see, I didn't make my deck very well. And so I found myself even near the end of the game trying to buy cards to compensate for my deck's weaknesses and shortcomings. I see. There were interesting choke points that developed over the map. For example, there was Temple that in order to go, you had to pay a coin, a specific coin token, not just a coin from a card, but a separate currency. And nearby is this Guardian that if you land next to it, you lose all your coins. And that killed me. That, like, sapped a solid three turns from my from my play because, yes, Huey was in my way, but it was more that I hadn't accounted for where I was going to get that coin back. So had I pr- thought of that and gotten myself to a position where I was able to generate coins through my cards a little better, I might have been able to keep up my momentum. But uh, it has that same sense that most deck builders do of starting out really pathetic and then suddenly you're clearing entire tiles in a single hand. And I do enjoy that, but that just completely killed me. I was zipping across all the map, and then suddenly I, I needed to get to the last temple. It just was not happening. And uh, you, and to a lesser extent, Huey, but you definitely were still wee and zooming all over the place. I really enjoy it. It's it's very good. It's very accessible. It's very solid. The little bit of player interaction, both from the Guardians and from some of the card effects and from just running into each other, I think really elevates it. And uh, the Golden Temples is is probably one of my favorite really light deck builders right up there with Shards of Infinity. And I really like how the, the art sort of brings it alive, right? It brings the theme out and how... Like just sort of the names on the cards and the and what they provide sort of gives you that you know this is the sailor and this is the advent you know I mean it just sort of like brings that all in that dapper gentleman that he's so dapper it's true I would trust him anytime and that was the quest for El Dorado the Golden Temples so this week we had Hallmark Holiday number seventeen so the children came over and I got to introduce them to some light games that I've already talked about abandon all artichokes. And Lama, Lama Dice, and we also played Lama Dice this week. Many Lama Dice. 
And Llama Dice for us brought out like a completely different type of strategy. It yes. keeps revealing its nuances, this Llama Dice. I was very pleasantly surprised because I've commented before that one of the things that I wish Llama Dice did more was give you more opportunity to play ri- fast and loose with the tempo, take risks at certain times, decide to stay in later by virtue of that. And in our last session, it was that in spades. We all had these junctures where we didn't know what cards to slough off. We didn't know whether we should stay in. And it was really rewarding in a surprising way. I wish I wish more sessions were like that. I agree. It was what what pretty well happened was the fact that all of the safety cards had disappeared, and it was just down to the fact. Well, if I bust, I'm only going to get a few points anyway, so I might as well just roll anyway. And it, it was, led to these very interesting circumstances. And it's very easy to teach. Kids picked up on it immediately. Same so, with sometimes you ride the llama, sometimes the llama rides you. It's so true, so so true. My father always told me that. Until they t- took them away. Yeah. <laughs> Same with Abandon All Our Chokes. It's a very interesting system that introduces completely new concepts and sort of opens the eyes of people who haven't played like uh, more modern games. This this notion of uh, at the end of my turn, if I draw a bunch of cards and if these happen to be certain cards, you win the game. It's It's like completely different rules, trying to get rid of cards and, you know, very welcoming art, nice, simple concept. Ben and All Artichokes is designed by Emma Larkins and put out by GameRight. Llama Dice is a Reiner Knizia design published by Amigo. The other solo tabletop war game that I got to play was Horizon Wars Infinite Dark. Infinite Dark is the spaceship follow-up to Roby Jenkins' solo co-op 28mm squad-based game called Zero Dark. So there's Horizon Wars which is going to be apparently redubbed Horizon Wars Midnight Dark later on. Then there's Horizon Wars Zero Dark, which is the 28 mil squad-based one. And then there's Horizon Wars Infinite Dark, which is about spaceships. And this is released roughly at the same time as A Billion Suns, the other miniature spaceship game that, I ta- uh, that, that I've been talking about by Osprey. But Roby Jenkins has self-published this, and this is, again, a solo or co-op uh, amenable design. You can play versus, but you can also play by yourself. And the AI system that worked really well in Zero Dark works almost as well in Infinite Dark. So the ships have a sense of momentum. And they make relatively same piloting decisions, but they're not really going to come chase you in a direct way. It's much simpler when you're playing a 28 mil game and you'd say, well, it moves four inches towards the closest enemy. That's fine. But when a ship has momentum and facing and it needs to manage those systems, well, then things get a little bit different. The other thing that I found unfortunate about Infinite Dark, and I'll, I'll be singing its praises later on, is that compared to Zero Dark and indeed compared to most tabletop miniatures game, it has a lot of bits to manipulate on the table. Now, most tabletop miniatures war games are always on the cusp of being overwhelming anyway, what with the focus on components, what with you know the actual miniatures and terrain and all the other things. But then there's the question of what counters need to hit the table and what information needs to get managed where. And unfortunately, I feel that Infinite Dark just takes a couple of steps too far because you need to maintain the facing of the ship, you need to maintain the speed of the ship, you need to track the damage that's on the ship, and you also need to track how much power the ship has. And the power is rated out of a maximum number, so it's not just, you know, pile up a certain number of power counters. You need to know how many of them there are. And every time the ship moves, you need to be very careful that it moves in a straight line following its heading, and you need to adjust the speed based on a die that's, that's tracked on the table. And so... When you compare moving in most tabletop miniatures games, right, put out the tape measure, move it to four inches. Here you're pulling out the tape measure, moving it a certain number of inches, and then causing two or three things that are on the table to go follow it. And when you're doing that for both yourself and for all the AI opponents, it became a little too much to manage. Not in terms of a cognitive load, but just in terms of making sure all the, all the, all the pieces lined up. And so that I found a little bit unfortunate. But Infinite Dark does still have all of Roby Jenkins' trademark strengths. There are almost no fixed stat lines, and certainly no fixed fixed stat lines for yourself. Everything is almost infinitely customizable. You give them the stats you want, you give them the skills that you want, the upgrades that you that you choose to do in a very, very simple system. Infinite Dark also has a very strong emphasis on pilots that have their own background and personality, and that influences what they're able to do. And the resolution system, the bait noir of the, the Joseph McCulloch designs like Rangers of Shadowdeep, remains excellent. If you've never played a Romby Jenkins design, I can't recommend them highly enough, especially if you like clever dice mechanics. Very, very simple to resolve. You don't spend hours and hours just trying to tally up a plus one, minus one, plus two, whatever, what's my target number. 
But nonetheless, you get very interesting choices. And one of the things that Roby Jenkins' designs have in the in, in the Horizon Wars line is the emphasis on bonus actions. Well, I got three successes on a test that only needed one. I can now spend these extra successes on bonus actions and go do other cool stuff. And that remains very, very enjoyable. I prefer Zero Dark, partially because I just have more miniatures in that scale. I have a better familiarity with that scale. And as I said, it's a lot easier to manage. But I would be interested in trying a versus game of Infinite Dark, in part because I wouldn't have to manage the entirety of the components on the table, and because I think the versus system would show off to its better advantage by virtue of the fact that the AI system is a little bit dodgy in, case, in cases, I think. I don't regret picking up a copy. I love all of Roby Jenkins' work. I love listening uh, to him talk about war games. He's got a very interesting podcast, for what it's worth. And I'm very much looking forward to his future output, and I'm glad to have finally tried Horizon Wars Infinite Dark. I got to play an older game on Board Game Arena called Verona Twist. This is designed by Joseph Dorsineski and published by Mind Fitness Games. And what this is, is a 5x4 grid that's populated by sort of Shakespearean characters. You have the princess and the king and the, and the knight and the bishop. And one person knows, sorry, I'm sure nurse and... It's, I'm sure it's some Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet nurse was trying to keep them apart. I, no, know, no, the, nur- the nurse was was a co-conspirator. Okay, well, but the nurse was a major character. This is how they the, the two people one's nurse and one's someone else. You know, I, if I remembered Shakespeare, I'd be able to tell you. That being said, so someone knows who the actual couple is. You know, it's randomized at the beginning of the game, and the other person is trying to figure out who the actual couple is. So. All of the different pieces have sort of chess-like moves. They all move differently around the board. So, and they all can move once. So, the one and you take turns moving them around, and one person is trying to pair them up, and then there's a card for each pairing. So you can remove all of those cards that at the end of the round that they're all paired up, and then the person has to tell them whether because there's an inner block and an outer block. Are the two characters together? in the same block or they're in different blocks. And so it gives you these clues on who the actual couples are. So you get a few rounds to try to figure out, move the, move different couples together, try to get rid of all the cards and try to, you know, get down to, you know, figuring out. I thought it was a very interesting game. So it's a lot like Mr. Jack. I've not played Mr. Jack. Ah. So. Well, Mr. Jack similarly has this notion of moving characters around and then giving clues based on where they happen to be standing. Gotcha. I just really like the sort of chess-like element and, mm. you know, how you could zip a couple across the room and how one could only move, you know, one space diagonally. And it's like, okay, well, I really need these two together. And you sort of had to figure out because, uh, you know, you sort of think, I think those are the two. And if you move one, then they're going to move the other one next turn. So you sort of have to. And the nurse doesn't want them together. I'm not, no, I'm not sure which one doesn't want them together. Oh, okay, I, I, okay. I'm not okay. sure that, what the names are. I, I just, I just, you know, when I started talking about it, I, would say, I remember one of them being nurse. I forget who the other one is. I should well, have, I should dur- have wrote During those down. very rare intersections of board gaming and Shakespeare, I feel it is my obligation to go look it up, even though I should, I should stress, uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't really like Romeo and Juliet. It's not one of my preferred ones. Yeah, the other one's the Capulet. Capulet, that's Yeah, it. okay, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the nurse wants them together and the Capulet wants them apart. Okay. Well, I'm intrigued by any game that has a, a Shakespeare connection like that, even if it's not one of my preferred ones. And that was Verona Twist. I got to try Monumental. Monumental was kickstarted a couple of years ago, and then again recently for an expansion for a variety of African empires. Monumental is a deck builder meets civilization game. And the design remit for Monumental could very easily have been, how can we combine the most banal deck building with the most banal civilization game elements? I'm going to have a lot more to say to this. And in fact, I think one of the episodes that I'm going to pre-record for when I'm on the road is going to be me talking about civilization games and why I think they often fail. Because Monumental, I think, definitely encapsulates a lot of it. It's just utterly bland. And the fact that you call this incredibly trivial bonus as having been derived from, say, the Lighthouse at Alexandria or the Colossus of Rhodes doesn't mean your game's a Civ game, and it doesn't mean that your game is evocative of anything. Now, the gimmick to Monumental was you don't have a hand of cards. You have a, you, every turn, you build a three by three grid of cards and you activate one row and one column. But in effect, all that that means is you're choosing four cards you don't really care about because... If you're activating a row and a column in a four in a and three by get, three, and you get to build the grid yourself. 
No, they come out randomly. Oh, okay. But honestly, I never really felt there was too much tension. Normally, I'd, you know, look at a couple cards. I definitely want to activate this. I definitely want to activate this. I'm relatively indifferent to the rest of them. Okay, I'll do this form. Okay, fine. And the overwhelming majority of the time, you're just generating resources and using those resources to buy other cards. And most of those other cards generate other resources. It's like somebody played Dominion and said, you know what? Big money is obviously the most fun strategy. The opportunity of doing any interesting actions clearly detracts from the core value of a deck building game. So what if we made a game so that even the advanced fancy stuff basically just amounts to generating more stuff? I was not a fan of Monumental. <laughs> Which is too bad, because I remember, I didn't, I saw that you had it, I, re, I didn't remember it offhand, but now that you've described it, I remember it's something that I was interested in. Well, I mean, look, you can try it if you want to. I, I, I suppose I'd play it with you. The, the other thing about Monumental that I find very striking is that it, for, for, this is one of those rare instances where I join some of the chattering masses online, look at a game and say, this would have been better without miniatures. Because the miniatures are gorgeous, I'd just like to say. The miniature for Chinggis Khan in particular is one of the most impressive figures I've seen in quite some time. But there are explorers and then there are soldiers. Soldiers control territory, explorers don't. If they're the same size and the sculpts are different, but nonetheless not easily differentiable at a glance, it's not helpful. And I would have rathered, uh, in the, in the, the basic version, soldiers were represented by tokens of a different shape and so you could e more easily eyeball which was what and so i honestly felt that the minis detracted in point of fact it is not possible to put all the miniatures on your capital city the way they tell you to you just have to leave them off the board which is not a problem this is not a difficulty this is not my complaining about how it's not usable be because your capital is unattackable so how many soldiers are there is irrelevant might as well just be on in front of you and teleport onto the board later that's cool uh, but I, several times, while looking at the board, had difficulty, like, wait, is that an explorer or is that a soldier? Do you have that territory? No, I don't. Okay, fine. It, I, it was functional. It was it was so bland as to be offensive. But other than that, it was inoffensive. <laughs> <laughs> and that was monumental. And finally for us, we played another game of Groundhog Day, the game. This is by Prospero Hall and Funko Games. And I, I, I'd like to divide, with all due respect to Prospero Hall, and we will, of course, be giving our due honor to Prospero Hall later on in our much derided segment, Swag Presents Masterpiece Theater, in honor of Prospero Hall. Prospero Hall design, design seem to be divisible into two buckets. There's the bucket of kind of novel, and I, into that I would put Fast and Furious Highway Heist, which is not super, it's not super unique or groundbreaking or anything, but it's not something that I can point to it and say, this is clearly just a reskinning of this other type of game. And Top Gun is also a game I would put in that category. Yeah, if you really wanted to, if in a stretch, you'd say, well, it, it's an air combat game with template movement, so I guess it's just like x one but I think that that's flattening too much. And then there are games that are basically Prospero Hall looking at the Euro game market and saying, oh, you know, that, 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 that's a fine game, but we can integrate it really well with this property. And into that, I would put Horrified, I would definitely put Groundhog Day the game into this as well because contrary to my I think it was roughly 25 minutes long discussion of Groundhog Day the movie as relates to the game it is a reasonably good evocation of some of the core elements of the movie Groundhog Day the game is basically just the mind the game called the mind as applied to Groundhog Day but all of that having been said I find it very enjoyable. It's quick. It's got tension. It's got moments of panic in a real-time co-op game, which is nice. Everyone looking around each other suspiciously wondering who should play next. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's Ned Ryerson. Anyway, I have a great time with Groundhog Day the game, even though it's super derivative. And the fact that it's a co-op game we've won both times, at least the both times I've played it, this time was a little more sort of nail bitey because there was we some... stepped well because I stepped up the difficulty. There are difficulty settings. Oh, and you did. If we play it again, I'll step up the difficulty again. Good stuff. Yeah. And, and because this time we played it, there's like these key cards that you have to play in the final round. And we actually played some in the second to last round, and we thought yeah. all was lost. But that being said, still love it. Hopefully, it will get harder. A good set of intersecting pressures. Exactly. And those are the games we played last week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So Mark, have you heard of a game called Castello Mattoni? This is designed by Leo Chiovanni and published by Mandu Games. And it was put out in 2019. And this is on the Board Game Geek news page. And you and you wonder why? Well, why is this suddenly on the Board Game Geek news page? Is there suddenly is it is there a new Kickstarter for it? Is there an expansion for it? 
why is it suddenly up on on the news page, Mark? <laughs> that usually only has games that are be going to be coming out like this month, or you know, in in a couple of weeks, or or brand new games. Why do you think that it's on their news page, Mark? Do tell, Walker. Because uh, it's available in the Board Game Geek store now, Mark. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So this is the first one that's you know, sure. Jump the shark. So we'll see how much more of this we get. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I always shared your misgivings conceptually about the fact that Board Game Geek Store is now offering more and more titles. That is somewhat unfortunate, yeah. I mean, is this the first time it's available in North America? As far as I know. Oh, okay. Well, then that's that's something at least, right? Yeah, and it looks very interesting. Like, like, like I, I, don't, I don't think if the game wasn't interesting, I would bother even talking about it. The game does look fairly interesting. It's sort of like a a area majority and you're walling off parts of of these different areas and you're fighting other people over it looks fairly interesting abstract game and in the context of the news article they don't provide you know a hyperlink to the board game store at least true <laughs> but i share your misgivings for what it's worth maracaibo is getting a digital Im- implementation but only for handheld devices i don't what? know why yeah it's very odd Maracaibo. Maracaibo on hot, on handheld, so Android and iOS only. That's an interesting choice. I'm I'm hoping that it'll just be in, maybe it's just a late announcement. Maybe at first it'll only be those two platforms. Soon to be on Steam. We can only hope. We'll see. Hmm. So Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. This is the card game that's not actually Terraforming Mars. It's the card game that's not actually Terraforming Mars. Yes. It is going to be released in mass market distribution, namely Target, which is an American big box store. And that isn't necessarily the problem. Uh, The problem that some people have, and this is a widespread complaint that I've seen in a number of places online, Target is going to be selling the game before Kickstarter backers get their own copies. Nice. Here's the thing. I'm deeply sympathetic to everyone involved in this case, right? And obviously, I don't have any interest in playing Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. I I don't really care. But I think that what this is, this is another indication that different people are approaching Kickstarter with different sets of expectations, you know? And this leads to both cynicism and approval, as far as I'm concerned, as as a consumer. Like, some people say, oh, you know, those cool men are not Kickstarters. They're just an excuse to get a, a huge bucket load of plastic and a whole bunch of game expansions all at once. To which I say, yeah, yeah. That's the point. Well, that's what I'm here for. And this being and said, that's okay. I think there is a general conception, and I, and I don't think it goes too far mm-hmm. to say that that people assume when they kick when they put out money for the Kickstarter that they will be receiving the game before other people. That's part of the Kickstarter sort of. I I hear you, but my point is this, and this is in fact why I bring it up, and this is this is entirely the point of the different expectations. I think it would be better if people disabused themselves of that notion. I don't know that it's a reasonable expectation anymore. We So we've been observing Kickstarter more or less ever since it became a very viable platform for board game distribution. You know, we started in the hobby and we were collectors before Kickstarter came around. And so we've seen it evolve. And, you know, the first thing that disappeared was the expectation of free shipping. That went away. And then there was the expectation that... You were going to get it before any form of retail distribution. I think that should have gone away years ago because we've seen far too many counterexamples. I'm not trying to cut Stronghold Games slack. I believe in transparency and open communication, right? But I don't know if it's still the responsibility of publishers to explicitly flag on a Kickstarter campaign. You're going to get it before anybody else. I think it's going to lead to badness. Only because then the only reason to Kickstart a game is to get the Kickstarter exclusive stuff. Right. Is that not the case? It could be. I, I it To could my be, mind... But I, I'm just wondering, could it not be just to promote the... Pro, you know what I mean? You're also getting it so you'd get it before everyone else. You know what I mean? You're sort of giving the money Where's beforehand. that coming from, though? Since we've seen that... Uh, again, I, I'm empathetic, and I'm not trying to be combative here. I know. What I want to know is where where's that expectation coming from? Just I maybe, think it, it's... Maybe be- it's just one of the benefits. Maybe it's one of the re- part of the reward. Sure, and if you say that it is, if a publisher says that you're going to get it before anybody else does, then absolutely, yeah. I'm willing to hold their feet to the fire in any case. 
completely 100%. Because it's got it's going to be it's huge cheaper to wait. I'm just saying in the long yes. run it's going to be bad for the distributors, not the distributors, the producers because it's infinitely cheaper to buy it at the store. You just not you're just not going to get the perks. Well, that's just it. I it, when I look at Kickstarters now, I look at look at it almost exclusively as a question uh so there are two buckets. Let me be clear actually. Sorry, there are two buckets. Of plastic. <laughs> that come from Simo. No, no, plastic is oh. only in one of the two okay. buckets. All right. In the bucket that doesn't have any plastic in it are the really small operators that have modest goals, low threshold, and you have no conception about whether or not this is ever going to show up in retail. And if it does, it might be a tiny print run, right? There are tons of projects that look like this. And honestly, if you're experienced in the hobby, you can probably see these coming from a mile away. You haven't heard of the publisher. It's a small shop, or maybe it's a publisher that does a very, very, very niche operation. They've done some projects before that funded for, you know, 50 grand here, two grand there, whatever. And those people... Kickstarter is fulfilling, you know, the sort of romanticized, idealized version of Kickstarter. And I hear people talking all the time, Kickstarter should only be this one thing. I am not sympathetic to that line of argumentation because no. in the second bucket, the one that's full of plastic, I view my relationship with Simon, of course, as the usual culprit, but take your pick. There's any number of other people that do this. Mythic Games, Monolith, the people who now work on GameFound exclusively in the form of Awakened Realms. You know exactly what relationship you're getting in with those people. You give them an interest-free loan that they don't need because they're going to fund anyway without your participation, right? You're going to get the product in a long time, and you're getting a huge amount of volume of components for your money. The, and, and, and honest, and some of those components are going to be difficult or impossible to find aftermarket. That is the, the sort of expectation that the market has solidified into. And honestly, as a consumer, I no longer have the expectation of anything else other than the fact that any explicit promises are going to be kept. And of course, yes, Simon has gone back on their word on a, a number of times. And absolutely, we've criticized them for when they've said they would do something and then they didn't. But this, this expectation that you're going to get it before anybody else now, there, uh, and again, to be fair, there are ways that publishers play fast and loose. Like when they say that something is a Kickstarter exclusive, and then they say, well, you know, we didn't say exclusive to which campaign. We just said it was going to be exclusive to Kickstarter generally. And I'm like, oh, come on, guys. You could have been a little bit more clear on that one. I'm not defending behavior like that. But if you don't promise first access to backers, I... Eh. I mean, it well, might... Fenrir is exclusive to Kickstarter, but this this different Fenrir sculpt is now exclusive to this other. No, 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 it was Garm. It was never Fenrir. Oh, sorry, it was sorry, Garm. Sorry, sorry. My, my, my mistake. <laughs> different wolf, entirely different wolf, same ability. Yeah, look again, fast and loose like that. I, I, I get a little bit there. I think Simon was in a no-win situation, right? Because they have a whole bunch of people clamoring for stuff they can't get, except for two hundred bucks on eBay, and some other people are saying, no, 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 you're reducing the value of my wolf by putting out a different wolf. I don't know what they should have done in that context, so I'm willing to cut them some slack. Anyway, suffice to say, I, I'm glad I was able to hear from a contrary expectation. And just for the record, the target version of Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition has worse stuff than the Kickstarter version. Now, the only thing that matters is that the player board is cardstock rather than dual-layer chipboard. Uh, the other stuff is nonsense. Like, it doesn't have full-bleed art and the uh, on the cover and oh, box of, and, uh, se- and some and 17 promo cards. Okay, so there are ga- there are gameplay exclusives in the Kickstarter version. I was going to say, it can't be any worse than the production value of Terraforming Mars. So. <laughs> sure. Interesting discussion. We'll have to table this. I'm sure we'll have occasion to discuss similar issues again in the future. Finally, for me, in an upcoming episode, we're going to bring back our question period. So please send all questions to justrollthedice at gmail.com. That's J-U-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E. The dice. Or you can post them. I'm going to put a, a, a forum on the guild. The guild is on Board Game Geek, guild number 3236. I'm just going to try to keep it just to those two places so I don't have to search five million different this is one of the reasons why we don't do Discord either, because we want to concentrate the vocabulary in one place. So we apologize <laughs> for uh, if you can't access the the guild on Board Game Geek, but that is the way the cookie crumbles. And feel free to ask us about anything, about games that we have talked about, games we haven't talked about, backgrounds, favorite flavors of ice cream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anything's on the table. Are, do we consider ourselves fast, or do we consider ourselves furious? <laughs> Which is it? Slow and sluggish, mostly, but... 
Finally, for me, there are going to be a trio of Reiner Knizia games published by fledgling publisher Bitewing Games. This is going to be the Criminal Capers Collection, consisting of true re- reprints and one novel game, all of them smallish card games from The Good Doctor. Doctor here is in quotation marks, very much like Dr. Steve Finn of Dr. Finn Games. There's going to be Soda Smugglers, which is a rethemed version of Hesawari. There's going to be Pooh Mafiosi. Do you get it? Mafiosi? Pooh Mafiosi? It's a Puma who's a Mafiosi. Yeah. Do you get it? Yeah. Do you get it? It's a Puma. It's a Puma Pooh Mafiosi. Do you get it, Walker? I unfortunately do. It's important to me that you get it. Okay. Which is a reskin of Rooster Booster, which, quite frankly, I think is the, the version I'd prefer. And Hot Lead. All of these are based on anthropomorphic animal criminals and or law enforcement, as exemplified by Pooh Mafiosi. And I am always in favor of more Kinsey games being in print, although I suppose uh, I'll just have to wait for the uh, alleged incoming reprints of Raw and Tigris and Euphrates and Blue Moon. We'll just have to wait for those, but uh, I'll take these in the meantime. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now on to our topic of the week, which is combos, the agony and the ecstasy. Now, I was I was surprised when you when you suggested this. Trying to keep you on your toes. Because it's like off off the board game topic. But I also, I always have this problem. Like you go in, you only want a hamburger, right? And then you're in line and you're looking at the menu and you're like, okay, fine, you know, some fries. And it's like, you don't really want the drink. No. But no. By, at that time, the drink's free. We're not right? talking about fast food. And then idiots. there's breakfast and you know you get a block away and no, you're, you're no. going to want the hash brown anyway. You need to stop. Right? It's not about fast food. We're talking about the pretzel cheese snack, obviously, those combos. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Ah, so stupid. I'm so sorry. But when I was thinking about this, Mark, it is very... Oh, I'm wondering, when I was reading a bunch of stuff on this, what are we going to define combos as? See, this is going to be something that is is not going to cause any controversy. <laughs> nor will it spawn any discussions whatsoever. Oh, no, 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 no. Geeks and nerds are very accommodating for different conceptual schema and different taxonomies. But I think we're at a point, because it's a fairly vast industry, and we really need to lock down what it means when we say combos. <laughs> Do we? I think so. Because I can think of several different types, and I think from they what, all deserve from, the title. I, really? Because yeah. they, but then you won't know what, what you're talking about, like combos. <sighs> it's like, because... <laughs> here we go. So, like, but... but but when they say a combo, it's not really. It's just it's just building your engine or it's action efficiency. Like sometimes a lot of things I read, they said that Dominion is is a big combo game. Yeah, really. What's comboing? Because when you just a second, let me just finish. Because when you play a card, it just does what it says. Yeah. It, it's not telling you any specific card. It's just generic things. Well, this is it. I think there are different versions of how combos can work. Right. I think when people talk about how Dominion leads to good combos, it's about how certain action cards in conjunction with each other work well. So you, made, our, so you made a good engine. You built a good engine. It's a good engine builder. That is one aspect of building a good engine sometimes. It, it, yes, that part of certain combos can be subsumed so, under So this, this is the thing that I had with Shards Infinity. So uh-huh. When you get Shards Infinity cards, yes. they say it'll combo off of blue types of this card yes. or this particular key word. That is a different and, kind and of I, combo, yes. Well, I think that's more specifically a combo. than. That's fine. And then same with Quantum. Quantum came up a lot. They said, oh, there's tons of of combos in Quantum because of the special abilities of all the ships. And I said, no, sure. that's, that's just action efficiency. That just means you Some use Some combos those lead to act- action efficiency. Some combos lead to engine building. It depends on the kind of game. Evolution. You know, when you're... Okay, slow down, slow down, slow down. No, no, this is all part of the topic. <laughs> I know, I, I know. Bringing but this stuff. You're, okay. you're breezing over to oh. my... Like, well, no, are... we're going to come back to all some right, of this okay. stuff. In long story short, you could say Hansa Tonica is combos, right? Because you're getting more actions, which leads you to do, you know, better things. So it's they're, it's comboing off. Or I or, don't or, think... Or, I wouldn't call it... Com- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call that combos. Robo Rally. Is Robo Rally a combo game? I played left. That means I move forward, and now a right card is great. So my right card... Are we going to have a discussion, or do you want to no, be obstreperous? No, no, I'm not. Okay. Mark. I'm just saying that if you if you let all of these things be combos, then you're just leaving everything open to be a combo. Because I played... To my mind... Left here. To now, my mind, a combo, if you want a generalized definition, Definition, as much as I loathe to offer such things, in order for something to be considered a combo, it ought ideally, not necessarily, it ought ideally to have disparate, non-commensurate effects interacting in such a way 
that produces either something that's more than the sum of its parts or at the very least a pleasing kind of interaction. So in the context of Hansa Teutonica, if I upgrade my track such that I'm generating more actions, it gets me to the same kind of place as a combo, uh, a, an engine builder with lots of combos in that I'm now doing more on my turn. But they do so in different ways. And specifically the way that you might do it in Dominion, where two different action cards work really well together and help you get further than you would on a, the strength of either one alone, is a different kind of thing than the additional effect you're going to get from an upgraded track in Hansa Teutonica. True. I just have a line, of, instead of saying something like, you draw X cards, where it would be, you draw X cards based on how many Y cards you have. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's like... That's what I mean. There's more intricacy than... Precisely. The two... the uh, More than one bit is interacting with another bit that exactly. is not itself. Yes. So, like, And Dominion does not have that. Uh, well... As I'm saying, that as, as, a, as a light example, I'm not saying, you know, Dominion is not a combo game. I'm just saying as, as, my, as my argument, games like that where a card just says draw X cards. Well, opposed- that's... The, okay, that's the thing, though. I would... I actually prefer... Not that I really like Dominion a whole heck of a lot, but I prefer the way Dominion does it than the way, say, Shards of Infinity does it. I've actually got a, a sort of, not a taxonomy, but a, but a different kinds of categories. And the specific kind of combos that exist in Shards of Infinity are what I'm going to call Leibnizian combos. And yes, I realize this is hopelessly nerdy, and this is because there's this notion in philosophy of Leib- Leibnizian identity, whereby two things share... Well, anyway, it, it, it's a way of rigidly defining identity. And an example of such a combo, a Leibnizian combo in Shards of Infinity, is a card that will say on the market, do this thing. If you happen to be playing one of these five specific characters, it also does this other thing. And that, to my mind, is like the lowest level of interest for me. I'm not saying it's a lesser form of combo. I'm saying it's the least interesting for me. Because, yes, it combos in the sense that it is comboing with your innate character's identity, which normally is just a proper name, unless you have one of the expansions that gets you one of the relics. But setting all that aside, because it's literally just I, card, am interacting with a specific token. One specific thing, and it's just blunt. Well, I played it, and I'm this other. I'm this guy. You Sorry, know, th- I got mixed up. Were we doing Shards Infinity or Red Rising? Sorry, did you switch? That's just it. Red, Ri- Red Rising is another example. So is Fantasy Realms, right? Fantasy Realms and Red Rising will tell you at the end of the game, this card A will give you a bonus if you also have this other specific card B. And th- these, I think, are pretty clearly identifiable as combos. I don't just don't find them very interesting. And then there's the other thing that came up where combining things... So co- maybe combining and combos, is, so the the smash up came as is as, as a big oh sure as a as a combo game, and I, I'm not sure because then you could say Sentinels of the Multiverse is a is a combo game sure why not like based on or or when we play that that's different though that's like setting up a combo as a way of framing the scenario as opposed to using combos in the actual game. But I think Sentinels does Sentinels of the Multiverse also has combos in the actual in, game. In the mechanisms. Yeah. But I meant just like when we pick our characters, when you decide, you know, what sure. best characters are. Sacri- if if or two s- characters synergize particularly well to well with each other, I would argue that that constitutes a form of combo. Or Sacra Arms or Galaxy Absolutely. Hunters. Absolutely, no doubt. All right. You said, <laughs> no, no, why no. the misgivings? I, I, like I said, I, I don't know. I'm just saying there's so many things that you can define as combos there. Sure. I know. I'm not saying that's it's a good a, thing or a bad a, thing. It's a pretty broad topic. Okay. I will grant you. All I right. will grant you. So let, let's talk a little bit about Sentinels because I think it shows a different kind, a, di- a different couple kinds of combos. And again, I, I, I've got kind of terms for them. Uh, one of them I call pile combos, which are not particular. again, not necessarily particularly in- interesting. In other words... If you do something, I'm going to trigger an ability or play a card that's just going to add more to the pile. A classic example of this, and this kind of goes back to, to, to undercut what I said before about two different kinds of elements interacting. But if I'm playing Legacy, for example, and I trigger my power that says, until the start of my next turn, everyone does plus one damage, well, I'm just tacking on a modifier to people. Now, some people are going to benefit more from this than others. For example, one of our one of our favorite characters, certainly with respect to me and Dewey, is Chrono Ranger, who not uncommonly does many instances of small bits of damage over the course of his turn. So... Not only is this ability of Legacy comboing off of a variety of effects that Chrono Ranger is triggering, the two characters themselves fundamentally combo well together because of this expected interaction. Another example of pile combos, where you're just adding more stuff to the pile, I would actually argue is Witchstone. 
Because in an, in an average late game turn of Witchstone, you're playing a tile which generates five of this action and three of that action. Two of your first kinds of actions generates another kind of this other action. And suddenly this turn spirals out of control. And instead of doing seven total actions of two types, you're doing 12 total actions of four types. And that's just, again, those, and in the case of Witchstone particularly, and this is one of my disappointments with an otherwise fine game, is the different actions all felt like I was getting to the same place. And so I didn't feel like I was doing anything more interesting than just buffing the damage of Chrono Ranger when I was just piling up these actions. Does that make sense? It does. And card games do this a lot. You know, there's lots of combos, like Magic the Gathering, tons of combos. Oh, yeah. Mar- Marvel Legendary has an interesting combo where you can combo up your ability to read to do what the card says. <laughs> And then sometimes I'm wondering <sighs> if combos can be used to find how how you word things, right? So if, sometimes if it's like every time you buy X, you get a victory point, versus every time you receive X from the market during a purchase action, you get one victory point per item received in this way. <laughs> I need to know more about the items. Like if the item itself. It- is nothing more than the victory point, I would argue that's not really a combo. But if it's the case that you have some sort of ability, either generated by a card or some tableau effect or whatever, that says every time you purchase a card, in addition to whatever else the card does, you then get some Benny on the side, well, then that's a classic example of a combo, no doubt. And indeed, I I mentioned tableaus. I really do think that the joy of stringing together stuff like this is one of the reasons why tableau builders are so popular. Because combos are pretty fundamental to almost all tableau builders. It's like, well, I can use this card to change off this other thing, which this card generates the resource for something else. This applies to tableau builders that we enjoy, like 51st State Master Set. Nightfall. Well, I need to get the card that's going to generate the fuel, and then the fuel I'm going to use to power this card, which gives me victory points, you know. That's both an engine and an example of a combo. I realize this this rubs you the wrong way. It triggers you. It causes you a great deal of, of angst. But it makes perfect sense to me. Okay. (laughs) The kind of combo that I I find most interesting for what it's worth, which also is most daunting to a first player, is where some of the game fundamentals are absent from the turn structure. In other words, there are certain fundamental things that you might be expected to do over the course of the game, or you might even expect uh, to do, even from just having knowledge of other games, that the game doesn't let you do by default. A specific example of this are some of the PAX games and definitely Innovation. Like, when you're playing Innovation, you might tell people, well, one of the ways you can win is by achieving. In order to achieve, you need to score points. And then someone asks, well, how do you score points? Like, well, you don't unless a card tells you you can. And there are a number of instances like that. And so in order to be successful in Innovation, which, again, is one of my favorite tableau builders, you need to build your engine from the ground up, not even in the sense of building an engine like I'm now generating more rock than I was before. Just the game doesn't work until you make it work. You need to be, you're given all the tools, but you need to be able to find your way from point A to point B. And very frequently you find a very impressive combos. This is the card that lets me accumulate vast quantities of cards. This is the other card that lets me turn those cards into points. As an example. And then there's the exact the opposite, where, it's, where a game system will throw waves and waves of abilities, and then the, and then people, either other players or you, just find, out, uh, find ways to combo off them. An example of this is Spirit Island. You're putting out all of these cards, and they're generating symbols, and throughout your turn you can use the symbols to, you know, use other abilities. Other players can use, you know, the cards that you've played. It's all these, you know, interwoven combos, I thought it's just an amazing system. Oh yeah. The, the amount of ways for different effects to interact, both from your, you know one play of yours to your next play, or from another spirit's ability. Because that's really where the, the player interaction can get dialed up to the next level, where you're suddenly in a position where it's like, look, if you can move if you, my neighbor, can move these three to Han over into this region, and if you, other person, can push these things in this particular case, and you're buffing me in this way, well then, I'm going to result in this massive ability. There are some ability combos that I also really like that are kind of, uh, sort of, under the same juncture, and this is where, these are games where you can't really do anything very efficiently unless you exert combos. The classic example, to my mind, of this is Agricola. At the start of the game, you're engaged in very inefficient actions. Like, I'm, I'm spending my entirety of my, of my family member's action, which is half of my turn, to go collect 
to read. And that's all that I'm doing with my action. But you start playing out some family members. You start playing out, you know, building a tableau for what it's worth, kind of, sort of. Although Agricola isn't really a tableau builder in the classic sense. And by the end of the game, you you know, you're sending out your family member. It's like, okay, well, I go here. That gets me two, fo- two food to read. And uh, I get to do this other action, bake some bread. There we go. And this this is an example of you have to be able to combo those things in order to get well, but then sometimes also you're still forced to do those inefficient actions because there's only so far that your combo ability can get you. And those I find very interesting. That juxtaposition of efficient comboing with the expectation that sometimes you're just going to take it on the chin, and that's one of the reasons why Agricola is demanding, and I like it. It's funny. I wrote a bunch of uh, uh, statements here on on comboing, Mm -hmm. and I realized that they're all negative. Yeah, you seem to be adopting. Don't let me tell you how you feel. I I don't feel that way. I love combo games. You know I do. We've played tons of combo games, and I find them very interesting, but it's just just odd that... Give me your your negativity, because I have a number of negative comments about combos. uh, Sometimes you never play the game right. You miss things, or you forget something, because these things, you know, know, constantly, you know turn out and you've forgotten to give yourself a plus one or or you missed an action or you realized you know there's so much going on that you simple something. simple accounting errors and or the inability to internalize all the bonuses you've accumulated so you end up doing things wrong and then feeling like a maroon afterwards i agree and sometimes they get out of hand so it slows the game down because yes. your turn takes too long that's exact. That was the primary thing that I was thinking of when I dis, when I when I suggested the subtitle, "The Agony and the Ecstasy of Combos," because I understand why people love combos. People love triggering combos. It's one of the key appeals of Magic: The Gathering, after all. They make you feel smart. They make you feel like you're doing something cool, and nobody else cares. <laughs> it gets right? that. That was another point. Yeah, because <laughs> people just lose interest. Yeah. Right. It's heads down. It's like, okay, here he goes again. Yeah. Walker's playing his fifteen villages. I'll just, you know, yeah, w- look at my phone while he, you know, cycles his deck thirty times. Absolutely. And the same was the same thing was happening in Witchstone. Again, this was one of the downtime. Never really got too too bad. But by the time someone's tallying off on their fingers and or using one of the many helpfully included components to track the number of actions, by the time you're, you're on your fourth action type and your third instance of that action, I've tuned out, and I just want you to tell me when you're done. That being said, some games rely too heavily on these combos, and sometimes people fall into... Uh, like a great combo, you know, just the right card. They just happen to draw the right cards, or when it's their turn, just happen, the right cards happen to come up, and now they, oh sure, now they've got this crazy combo working, and everyone's just like, okay, well, I guess that's that. Usually, there are design tricks that you can do to make sure that that's less likely to happen. But if somebody, if the game is sufficiently fragile that you can just stumble into an immediate combo, that's why I like them to be a little bit more intricate. Not so intricate that you lose track of everything, but like. Uh, in the example of innovation, the example of the PAX games, and the example of 51st State, you need a couple of pieces to be in place before you can get from point A to point B. And then again, ideally, as is the case in innovation or 51st State especially, uh, there are really ways to kneecap somebody's engine or combo system if they happen to stumble into one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's my next point was it sort of dovetails, dovetails into what I said before is that sometimes people feel helpless. They can't stop. Like once the combo is in its like swing, just, they're just going through it. And right. Nothing, some games have interrupts or things that you can do to stop them while they're comboing, but not. It's not a usual thing. Usually, you have to wait till they're done, and then you have good systems, like you said, like Fifty First State, where you like destroy their infrastructure so they can't do that anymore. Yeah, and one of the benefits of that is Fifty First State Master Set. It never gets sufficiently complicated that it's opaque. If somebody's activating a card and they say, well, I do this and I'm going to get five points, you can just look over and see what's going on there and then very easily diagnose the way to either bleed them of the resource they need and they need, or get rid of that action card in general. If someone's involved in a, a game with not enough player interaction or it's the case that the combos are sufficiently opaque that just, you know, they're moving a whole bunch of stuff around and then points, that's less satisfying. I agree. Yeah, and then my last point sort of does tails into that where it's nice and easy, it's easy to fix, but when they get a little too complicated, sometimes it's hard to keep the balance, right? Yeah. So when they add an expansion or other cards or just the game in itself, sometimes one card will throw off the whole balance of the game. I agree. Which, again, is one of the reasons why I like things like innovation, because the goal is in many ways to break the game. <laughs> the combos are uh, sufficiently wild that by the time someone stumbled into a combo that's that egregious, they're going to rush the end of the game anyway, in most instances. I mean, mostly, I, I guess where I'm coming from is I want combos in my games the same way that I want social interaction. You know, relatively brief and punctuated by bits of screaming. Exactly. And someone leaves crying. Precisely. Uh, and, you know, 
and again, I like a lot of games that do combos the way that I uh, that I've identified as my least favorite way to do combos. Shards of Infinity again, it's just really really simple. If your name is Bubba, when you play this card, you get a bonus. Like okay, well I guess that's a combo. Doesn't really make me feel clever. Uh, and even there are sometimes where games have better versions of combos, but also this lesser version. Uh, an example of this is Race for the Galaxy. There are cards in Race for the Galaxy that say if you have this other specific named card at the end of the game, you get extra points. But in Race for the Galaxy, there are better ways to manage your card throughput, and it has more interesting substantive combos anyway. Even Fairy Tale has that, where you get the you know the the Pixie Queen or the Dra- Pixie Queen, Pixie Queen, Fairy Queen. If you have the Fairy Queen and another and that card, quest card, and the that, quest card, yes. and you know it's one of those things where you you go for it, or you know you press your luck, and right. or you just happen to fall into it, and and you know it's a nice combo. Of course. Well, I'm glad I was able to bring you around a little bit. There you go. <laughs> well, like I said, I didn't have anything negative about it, but I, like I just started thinking about. You know what a combo is, and it's like, well, anything can be defined. I, as I disagree. A combo. I disagree. I agree that it is a wide field, but I disagree that it is so wide that it is meaningless. Agreed. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. You can stick around after after the credits for Swag Presents Masterpiece Theater. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. Please email your questions. That's J-U-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at The Games You Like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. And you can find us on Patreon and Twitch. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. If you liked the episode, tell a friend. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. Thank you, dear listeners, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, once again for joining us for Swag Presents Masterpiece Theater in honor of Prospero Hall. This time we are discussing Fast and Furious. Oh my God, Walker. Oh my God. You get to learn a new skill. I now know how to count to four in a foreign language. Cool. I know that mining in Mexico is very weird. <laughs> like normally I thought mines went down mm-hmm. and, and spread out. But yep. in Mexico, apparently they go in straight dead lines <laughs> in order to drive really fast cars in. Well, apparently in Mexico, they count to four as follows. It goes the two Tokyo Drift, and then Silence. Nice. Because this is the movie, I think, where it became perfectly clear that the producers had lost their ever-loving minds and their grip on reality. It's the fourth movie, and it is called Fast and Furious, which is also, for what it's worth, the name of the franchise. It's not the Fast and the Furious movies, it's the Fast and Furious movies. Oh my goodness. I was going to give you a pass for skipping the third ones, boys, but you can't have two movies in a row where the title makes no reference whatsoever to the order of things. It is insane. The last time I had my mind blown this badly by numeracy was when I learned about long scale and short scale, and I discovered to my shock and horror that the word million doesn't mean the same thing in different even English-speaking countries. And sometimes when they say million, they don't mean million. They mean something else. And sometimes when they say million and milliard, that's because there was a weird historical shift between long scale and short scale. That level of madness, that's what they're talking about. But there is Han in the movie, so 11 out of 10. On wins. Mustang update. There's a fifth generation Mustang in the movie, so all is well. Ah, 11 out of 10. <laughs> we'll watch again. Thank you very much, listeners, for joining us for Spike Presents Masterpiece Theater in honor of Prospero Hall and, of course, featuring the inestimable Air Doctor Dr. Vincent, Earl of Diesel, OBE Esquire. Join us again next week, where numbers will once again be introduced and reality will hold sway. All will make sense. <laughs>